Well, my job now is really just to build on the excellent contributions we've, we've just had as we think about uh, trying to make uh, God's way plausible, trying to make what the Bible says about sex and relationships seem plausible for people who experience same-sex attraction, both uh, within the church, but also the LGBT community outside uh, looking in. Uh, before we do that, I've been handed sort of two books down the row, which I think I'm supposed to be sort of waving at you. Let's see whether that's what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, one book um, is this book by Vaughan Roberts called Transgender that's uh, recently out and is just a brilliant short introduction to that whole issue and how we respond well to it. And I don't know how you've got hold of a copy of this because this is pre-publication. I wrote part of this, and this is the first time I've seen it, um, called uh, True to Form. Uh, which the FIC have, FIEC have produced as part of their Primer series, all about issues of sexuality and gender. Um, I've written one article on it, in it, but um, all the others look great. Um, I don't know about mine, but all the others, I can't wait to uh, sort of read this. I might even steal this copy that I've been given. I don't know. I think they're both available at the back. Let's pray again before we turn to thinking about uh, plausibility of God's word. Father God, we thank you so much for the stories we've just heard and of your grace in both Sam's lives and uh, your grace in bringing them to know you, but also your grace in helping them to continue to follow you and hold on to you. We pray that you'll continue to help them to do that. You'll be with them now. And we pray as we think about how we as a church, how we as churches can, can make your word seem plausible. We pray that your spirit would empower us because we know that we can't do it by ourselves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a plausibility problem when it comes to what the Bible teaches about sex and relationships, probably in general, but certainly when it comes to the whole issue of uh, same-sex attraction. And that's for both Christians who experience same-sex attraction, who might be sitting in the chair next to you on a Sunday, and also LGBT people who might be interested in the gospel of Jesus, but see this issue as the one thing that, as it were, is keeping them away. Uh, let me illustrate that. Uh, last uh, Saturday, I spent a couple of hours talking with a young Christian man in his mid-twenties. Um, his pastor brought him to see me because he wanted to meet somebody who was same-sex attracted, uh, somebody who was wanting to stick with what the Bible teaches, and somebody who might be having a bit of enjoyment in life at the same time because he thought that combination was impossible. And so he wanted to meet with me as exhibit A to see whether it was possible. I don't know how I did, but it was really striking sitting talking to him that the issue for him was, is it plausible? Is it plausible to be single for life, potentially? Is it plausible to keep fighting same-sex attraction day after day and live life to the full? He went away trying to make his mind up. Sad reality is that a lot of people I've met in those circumstances have walked away from Christianity, have walked away from Jesus, have walked away from churches because they don't think it is plausible. They don't think it's doable. And so often, the reason they've done that is because they've looked at the church that they're part of and they've looked at the Christians around them and they thought this would not be a community in which I could plausibly live as a same-sex attracted Christian. And that's been the moment they've walked away. Later, they've come to a review what they think God's word teaches. They've changed their mind on the goodness of God's words. But it's that moment of just looking around their local church community and thinking, I couldn't be a single person here for the rest of my life that schools them to walk away. And that's the issue. I want us to spend our time thinking about uh, today, this afternoon. How can we stop that from happening? For as it were, the same sex attracted people that are already in our midst. But also, how can we make sure that an LGBT person who would sit at the back of our church would look around and think, this is a place I could thrive. This is a place where I could live life to the full. How can we make sure our churches are the sort of churches that Sam was describing, where he saw a quality of relationships that drew him to Jesus? How could we make sure that Charlotte Chapel was one of those sort of places? I hope it is. How can we make sure it's even more one of those places where LGBT people could come in and feel these guys could be family 
to me. That's the key thing. That's the plausibility problem we've got. And I think Tim Keller's fair when he says that this is an area of challenge for us. This is an area in which we need to change. Listen to his words. They always challenge me about my church. I suspect they might challenge you about your church too. Jesus' teaching consistently attracted the irreligious while offending the Bible-believing religious people of his day. However, in the main, our churches today do not have this effect. The kind of outsiders Jesus attracted are not attracted to contemporary churches, even our most avant-garde ones. We tend to draw conservative, buttoned-down, moralistic people. The licentious and liberated or the broken and marginalized avoid church. That can only mean one thing. If the preaching of our ministers and the practices of our parishioners do not have the same effect on people that Jesus had, then we must not be declaring the same message that Jesus did. It's often said, isn't it, that if Jesus was around today, he would be in the gay clubs, he would be talking to gay people, and that's often used as a sort of, therefore we must change our, our sort of whole perspective on this. And that is a little unfair, but it does bring a challenge to us, doesn't it? If there's an element of truth in that, that Jesus would have been out in the gay bars of this city, there is a challenge as to why the people in the gay bars in this city wouldn't come into this church. How's that happened? How's that happened here in Edinburgh? How's that happened back home in Bristol? Well, it's happened because I think we've forgotten parts of the gospel. We've forgotten how the gospel should be changing every area of life. And we need to change. And if this day has felt a little bit depressing so far, I think this is when we should get excited. Because it turns out that our good God has looked at his church in the West and has seen a series of problems that we need to change. And I think this whole issue of uh, same-sex attraction, this whole uh, challenge of reaching out to the LGBT community is exactly what needs to happen to the church if we're to solve those issues. And I think this is a sort of a divine appointment, really, that we as the church today are having to struggle with this issue, are being confronted with these questions because they're going to get us changing in the ways that we most need to change. It turns out our God's sovereign. He's sovereign over history. And at this time in history, we're dealing with things which we need to deal with if we're to become more biblical, if we're really to get the gospel again and really start changing the world around us in massive ways. Quite a big claim, isn't it? Let's look at uh, some of the evidence. Let's look at how we can solve uh, this plausibility problem. Let's look at the things we need to demonstrate to reach out to the LGBT, LGBT community to help same-sex attracted Christians in our midst. The first thing we need to demonstrate is that brokenness is required. In fact, the only qualification that you need to become a Christian is a broken and contrite heart. You just need to be, as the Beatitudes would put it, poor in spirit. That's all you need, isn't it, to become a Christian, to be a broken person. And we need to demonstrate that again because the impression to the world around us is that you need to be a sorted person to become a Christian. They see people coming into this church building, coming to my church building but back in Bristol, and they see sorted people and they think that we exist just for sorted people. When actually, we're all about brokenness. My church in Bristol, we've been working through Luke's Gospel and we came to this verse, a wonderful verse in Luke 5, a couple of weeks ago. Jesus answered them, that was the religious uh, leaders of his day, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's a wonderful statement, isn't it, from Jesus? A wonderful statement about who his priority is for. People, he, was, he was here for the people who knew they were screwed up. He had not come for the people that thought they were okay. Is that the impression that we give to the communities we're at the heart of? That that we're broken and that Jesus has come for broken people like us. 
Tim Keller uses this illustration. He says, our, our church meeting should feel more like the waiting room at the doctor's surgery and less like the waiting room for a job interview. Just think about those two scenarios. Uh, waiting room for a, a job interview, everybody is dressed up, everybody is trying to impress everybody else, and as it were, trying to defeat the opposition even before you've gone into the interview by sharing their CV, by looking more impressive. Danger that our churches are sometimes like that. Everybody trying to put on their best show to impress other people. Actually, our churches should be like doctors' surgeries. Well, actually, everybody is not really caring what other people think of them because they just wanted to get into the doctor's room quicker. And if it's anything like my doctor's surgery, people sometimes get competitive about how ill they are in the hope that sort of people will let them sort of move up the queue. You know, cough a little bit more convincingly. People might let you out of the room because they're afraid of catching what you've got. Our churches need to feel much more like doctor's surgery. People waiting to see Dr. Jesus. That'd be really helpful, wouldn't it? If you're a broken person coming into a church and you, if you look around and you think, all these people are sorted, I'm the only broken person here, the danger is you're going to walk away. If you think, oh my goodness, all these people are as screwed up as I am, there is a likelihood that you'll stay. How can we better communicate that we're all broken? How can we do that? Well, that is something to ponder. But I love what Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, great middle name, uh, says. She encourages honesty in churches. And I think her words uh, need to be heard by me, my church, and I'm sure other churches today. She says, I think that churches will be, would be places of greater intimacy and growth in Christ if people stopped lying about what we need, what we fear, where we fail, and how we sin. I think that many of us have a hard time believing the God we believe in when the going gets tough. And I suspect that instead of seeking counsel and direction from those stronger in the Lord, we retreat into our isolation and shame and let the sin wash over us, defeating us again. Isn't that often the case? You turn up here on a Sunday, you've had a horrible week. Somebody says, how are you? Fine, how are you? And actually, we're not modeling brokenness. We're modeling the rules here are, I say I'm fine, you say we're fine, and we get on with whatever needs to be done. Doesn't mean that every Sunday you have to burst into tears as soon as somebody says, how are you? But it does mean that it should be fine to say, life is not going particularly well at the moment, or another euphemism that you might like to use in those circumstances. We can be honest, we can be open. If you want biblical encouragement to do this, just, just spend some time reading through Paul's letters. Turns out he spends most of his time talking about himself. And most of his time talking about how hard his life was. Not in a me, 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 look at me way, but in a let me point you to how Jesus has helped me in my brokenness way. I think that's what we need to be doing more and more. Sadly, one of the things that discouraged me from being open and honest about my sexuality was, was the thought that being open and honest would disqualify me from Christian ministry. Actually, I think being open and honest about our brokenness and our weakness qualifies us for Christian ministry. Paul would seem to be the sort of ultimate example of that. We need to somehow make sure that people feel in our churches that this is the place, this is the one place in the whole world where you can be most open about how hard life is, where you can be most open about what a mess you have made and yet receive God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. If we to make people both inside and out the side, outside the church think God's word and God's way is plausible, we need, we need to demonstrate that brokenness is required. We also need to find ways of demonstrating that adoption is everything. Adoption is everything. What do I mean by this? Well, 
What I mean by this is that my fundamental identity is not in the fact that I am a pastor of a church. It's not in the fact uh, that I went to a certain school. It's not in the fact that I read certain books. It's not in my sexuality. It's not in my status as a son or a brother. No, my fundamental identity is in the fact that I have been adopted, adopted by the creator God of the universe into his family forever. If you want to know what's most significant about me, that is the big information you need to hear. Adoption is everything. I love this verse from, well, you know, it's from the Christmas reading, isn't it? John chapter 1. We hear it every year, but it's mind-blowing, isn't it? Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he, that's Jesus, gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. My fundamental identity, your fundamental identity today, if you are a Christian, is you are a child of God. You have been created in his image. As children image their parents, you are his dearly loved child, his precious son, his precious daughter. So I want you to ponder for a few moments now, who are you? Not in a sort of angsty way, but in this sort of way. Do you, do you, when you most think about who you are, when you're asked to introduce yourself, do you talk about your marital status? Do you talk about your job? Do you talk about your sexuality? What do you talk about when you're asked to introduce yourself? How do you think of yourself, most of all? Do you think of yourself negatively? You don't like your body. Do you think of your positive, positive? Do you have a pride issue? Whatever. Whatever you think about yourself, however you define yourself, if you're a Christian, what most defines you is the fact that you have been adopted into God's family, the fact you are God's child. And I found that just incredibly helpful as somebody that's been encouraged by the society around me to identify myself fundamentally as a result of, of the few men that I'm attracted to, rather than the fact that the God who created the world chose me before the creation of this world to be one of his family, to be one of his children. Adoption is everything. Why do I say it's everything? Why do I say it's so important? Well, because this is really important as we live out our lives. This is really important as we try and work out what life actually is about. Listening to what Kevin DeYoung says as he sort of talks about New Testament ethics this whole issue of how we should live our lives. If I had to summarize New Testament ethics in one sentence, here's how I would put it. Be who you are. That, must, that might seem sound strange, almost heretical, given our culture's emphasis on being true to yourself. But like so many of the worst errors in the world, this one represents a truth powerfully perverted. When people say, relax, you were born that way, or quit trying to be something that you're not and, and just be the real you. They are stumbling upon something very biblical. God does want you to be the real you. He does want you to be true to yourself. But the you he's talking about is the you that you are by grace, not by nature. You may want to read through that last sentence again because the difference between living in sin and living in righteousness depends on getting that sentence right. God doesn't say, relax, you were born this way. But he does say, good news, you were reborn another way. So many people have said to me, oh, Ed, please stop trying to live this lie. You just need to be true to yourself. You just need to go with your sexual feelings. That's who you are. Stop trying to live a lie. I'm not trying to live a lie. I'm most of all trying to live in the light of the truth. And the truth is, God tells me, the truth is I'm his son and I've been created for perfection. And one day I will be perfect and live with him in perfection forever. That is, the, that is who I want to be, because that is who I am. It's not living a lie. That's living in the light of, of divine truth. We need to get that. 
We're not just the same sex attracted amongst us. All of us need to get that, don't they? Don't we? It's one of the things we need to be praying for, for each other most consistently of all, that we will be who we are. To pray that our church meetings give us a real sense of our identity in Christ above anything else. We need to demonstrate that adoption is everything. What else do we need to demonstrate? Well, we need to demonstrate somehow that, that singleness is good. And we've got, a, we've got a challenge here, haven't we? Because I don't think I've read a single novel or, or watched a, a single TV series or a single film that has, has given me a positive portrayal of the single life. I've been in a debate uh, with somebody about Mary Poppins. Some people think uh, that Mary Poppins is a single woman who's very happy with her singleness. I think there is something going on with Bert. Um, but that has been denied by others. But that is the only example I've ever been offered of a positive vision of singleness. And if Mary Poppins is it, <laughs> I don't want to be single. And it'd be lovely to say, wouldn't it, that the church is very different. That, yeah, out there everybody's negative about singleness. But in here, we're all very positive about singleness because we follow Jesus who was single. But I suspect the reality is, if you ask the single member of any church in this country, that the opposite is true. That singleness is seen as second best. And that if you're single, your life will only get sorted if and when you find a nice person of the opposite sex to settle down with. Kate Wharton's a friend of mine. Uh, She writes uh, this. She's a, a minister of a Church of England church. I've never heard a church leader said... What, what we could do with in our church is a few more single people. Actually, I have, I have once heard that, but it was only because the church minister wanted more people to help out with crash, which says something in and of itself. In not seeing singleness as good, well, first of all, we're ignoring Jesus, which is always a bad thing to do. And he lived life to the full, the great expression of humanity in all its fullness as a single man. But we're also ignoring really clear Bible teaching that singleness is good. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. I wish all of you were as I am. He was single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Later on in the chapter, he goes on to talk about how singleness is better, how singleness is easier. Is that what we've picked up from our subculture in our churches? It's a better thing? It's an easier thing? Let me tell you, it is easier to be single. One of the odd perks of my job as a minister is I can see, because I do marriage counseling, the messes marriages get into. Singleness is easier. And not just when marriages go wrong, just in many practical situations, it's much easier to be single. Much better to be single. We've lost that positive vision that God has given this great gift of marriage, but also the great gift of singleness. And we've either got one or the other. There are two great gifts. And both are good. So we need to ponder, how can we all be as affirming of singleness as the Bible is? Well, one thing we can do is stop matchmaking. As a victim of a lot of matchmaking over the years, can I say, please, please, please stop matchmaking, especially when you haven't asked the person or either of the people involved whether they would like to be matchmade. One of the most painful things for me as a same-sex attracted Christian was being trying to, you know, having these poor women that were being matchmade with me and who I would never be a particularly good match for. And nobody had ever asked either of our permissions about whether we would want to be matchmade. But also, try and find ways of celebrating singleness. We celebrate marriage a lot, don't we? We announce engagements, we have parties um, around weddings, and we're excited about them, and and that excitement is good, and it should be something that we get excited about. Can we find ways of being equally excited about singleness? One small little way would would be an example in my church's life a few weeks ago, which was uh, a single friend's 40th birthday. It's a brilliant party, absolutely brilliant party. Scots here will be pleased to know that we had a Kaylee, and that was what was particularly brilliant about it. But at the end, a married friend to me said, oh, that's such a good party. The best thing was, it was like a marriage, but better. 
And I went, well, that's what singleness is. You know, we, we were, as part of that evening, in some ways celebrating her singleness. Celebrating the number of, of friends she's got because she's single. The number of lives she's touched because she's single. Got to find ways of, of celebrating singleness. Of making sure that, that everybody knows that singleness is good. We've also got to find ways of demonstrating that friendship is essential. Now, as we talk about friendship, what I'm talking about is the real variety. I am not talking about the fact that you have 2,500 friends on Facebook. You do not. They are not genuine friends of yours. They are just people you met once or vaguely recognize. When we talk about real friendship, I'm talking about people that really, really know you and love you. And that is essential to life. That is essential to human flourishing, to have real friends, to have real intimacy. That is you were touching on earlier. Listen to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4. It's a passage I'm often asked to uh, speak on at weddings. I don't like to be asked to speak on it at weddings because it's not really about marriage. It's actually about friendship. So I talk about friendship and then add a little bit on about marriage at the end. Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. To thrive in life, to survive in life, you need more than one. You need two. You need actually, right at the end of that passage, three. And actually, four, five, six would help even more. Ecclesiastes 4 is reminding us that just to be alone is dangerous. The more people you can add to your network of support, to your friendships, the better life will be. Friendship. Friendship is essential. And we really need to rediscover this. Again, particularly, I think, in in Christian churches where we have invested everything in marriage and we've forgotten about the importance of friendships. Every single married couple that comes to me with their marriage in a mess has this, has this common thing going on in their lives. They got married, and since their marriage, their friendships have fallen away. And the marriage has started to go wrong because it's had to be everything. And when it has gone wrong, nobody's noticed until it's too late. So it turns out friendship is essential for married couples, let alone single people like me, who also need friends. Friends to laugh with, friends to cry with, friends to go on holiday with. Uh, Friends to help practically around the house. Friends who will give me a hard time about things. Friends who will laugh at me when necessary, which is a lot of the time. We all need, we all need friends. Just picking up on a point I've just made, listen to Andrew Sullivan. Families and marriages fail too often because they're trying to answer too many human needs. A spouse is required to be a lover, a friend, a mother, a father, a soulmate, a co-worker, and so on. Few people can be all these things for one person. And when demands are set too high, disappointment can only follow. If husbands and wives have deeper and stronger friendships outside the marital unit, their marriage has more space to breathe and fewer burdens to bear. If, if we all couple up, if we all pair off, what would that produce? That will produce lonely marriages and lonely singles. And the marriages will collapse and the singles will be unhappy too. If in our churches we have whole networks of friendships, married couples, friends with single people, a, a husband friend, a friend with another husband, a wife friend with another husband, he- another wife, a wife who's a good friend, whose best friend is a single woman, etc., etc., etc. Everybody will be better off. Nobody will have to live without intimacy. And everything about our churches will be better and stronger. We've got to make sure that people realize that friendship is essential. I want you to ponder this question, who are your friends? Or put it better, who are your real friends? 
Who are the people that know the best about you, but also the worst about you? Who are the people that have picked you up when you fell, or would pick you up if you fell? And if you're sitting there thinking, this is embarrassing, I can't think of anybody, you need to do something about it. One of the best things you can do about it is read Vaughan Roberts' little book on friendship. He got to a point in his life when he realized that, that he was getting more and more friends, but each friendship was becoming, as a result of that, more and more shallow. And what he needed was some real friends. And the book tells you how he went about doing that, making sure he had real friends, because he realized that the Bible teaches that friendship is essential. Penultimate thing we need to uh, demonstrate. Suffering is normal. Suffering is normal. One of the hard things I have to do in life is, is go around telling people that having an experience of same-sex attraction does not make my life completely and utterly miserable, but actually is life to the full. And it is, and I want you to know that. But at the other time, I want you also to hear that it does make life pretty hard at times. And it does bring suffering into my lives. And it does bring me on my knees in tears at times. I hate getting home at the end of the day to an empty home. I hate the pain, the physical pain, that, that resisting sexual temptation brings. I hate that and I find that really hard. The response of most unbelievers in my life when they hear me say things like those two things is, if it's hard... If it's bringing you suffering, it must be wrong, and so you must change. But that is not Christian, is it? It's deeply unchristian. Actually, Jesus tells us that suffering is normal, suffering is to be expected. In fact, if suffering isn't there, that's when you should ask questions. Listening to Jesus' first ever discipleship lesson with his disciples, Peter's just declared Jesus to be the Christ. Just declared him to be the king. What does Jesus say? Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. Turns out if you are going to follow a Christ who went to the cross for you, you are going to have to pick up your cross. You are going to have to suffer as he suffered in following him. The logic of the language of following Jesus means that you are going to suffer like him. You cannot follow Jesus without suffering like him in some way or shape or form. And so when you're suffering for being a Christian, you should not think to yourself, as I so often have, this is my Christian life going wrong. (laughs) Now, this is my Christian life going right. This is what shows it to be authentic, that there are things I've given up for Jesus, that there are moments when following Jesus brings me to my knees on tears because, remember, it brought him to his knees in tears in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those experiences of life being hard because you're a Christian show probably that you are a Christian, that suffering is normal. But wonderfully, and we've got to hear this too, Suffering is taken and it's redeemed by Jesus. It's taken and redeemed by Jesus. Again, think of the cross. Huge suffering, immense suffering, the greatest form of suffering that ever has been. Taken and used to redeem the world. Our suffering will be taken and used to redeem too, to help us become more and more like Jesus. Let me illustrate the the time when this idea most made a massive impact on me. Uh, I was on holiday after a really tough time at work, and I was wanting a break. I was wanting a break from work, but I was also wanting a break from uh, my struggle with same-sex attraction and the temptation it brings. I was sitting on a beach, and I'd deliberately gone to part of the United Kingdom where, to be honest, you don't ever usually meet anybody on a beach, and you can just relax and be with yourself. I was sitting down on the beach, uh, reading my book very happily, and a a gorgeous-looking guy came down, sat just uh, on the beach beside me, took off his top, and started sunbathing. I was furious. I was here, you know, wanting a break 
from temptation. And temptation had come and lied down on the beach beside me. And I was very cross with God. And that dangerous idea that God is not good came right to the forefront of my mind. Wonderfully, in God's goodness, I was reading a book on the beach that day. And this book was called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. The title is a clue that I did not pick up on the beach cafe. Um, It's a Puritan uh, book by a guy called Thomas Brooks, written centuries ago, but it spoke God's truth into my life in a wonderful way. Listen in. God will so order the afflictions that befall you in the way of righteousness that your soul shall say, we would not for all the world, but that we had met with such and such troubles and afflictions. For surely, had not these befallen us, it would have been worse and worse with us. Hold oh, the carnal security, pride, formality, dead-heartedness, lukewarmness, censoriousness, and earthliness that God hath cured us of by the troubles and dangers that we have met with in the ways and services of the Lord. Now that is quite complicated language. Let me try and explain what Thomas Brooks is saying. He was saying to me on that beach that day, Just think, Ed, of the worst things your experience of same-sex attraction has saved you from. That if you knew what you had been saved from, you would actually be grateful for this experience of same-sex attraction. And as I looked down at that list of the carnal security, pride, formality, dead-heartedness, lukewarmness, censoriousness, and earthiness that he provides, I thought, yeah, that is true of me. Because let me tell you, I am beautifully brilliant at self-righteousness. I do it so well. If you want to find me in the Bible, read the parable of the prodigal son and look at the elder brother and you've met me. Looking down on other people because of their sin. A a cross with God because I don't think he's given me what I deserve. That is me. My uh, naughty little sister grew up with a brother who was the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son. In God's goodness, he has given me this experience of same-sex attraction to undermine and to gradually expose and, I hope, begin to expunge that self-righteousness, if it's not self-righteous to say that he's begun to do that. It's the thing that he, when I'm feeling most judgmental, most censorious, most hard-hearted about the gospel. What so often happens? Fall in love with another beautiful man. And God takes and uses that experience and the repentance that I need to go through to remind me, leaping back to the beginning, of my brokenness and of my need of him and of the fact that I'm not away from the pigsty, but I'm in the pigsty and need saving once again. The suffering isn't just normal. Wonderfully, with our God who's in charge and our God who's good, it's, it's redeemable. It's redeemable. We need to ask, how can we help each other appreciate the good results of suffering in our lives? Let me just give one example. So often we have test me, don't we, at the front, as somebody who in the past went through this really hard time, but now everything's fine. I think what we need more of is people who are still going through a really hard time and who are just about clinging on to the promises of God with their fingernails and are discovering that he's, he's good not just after the event, but in the event. We need to show that suffering is normal. We also need to demonstrate that heaven is home. That the new heaven and new earth is home, is where I really belong. That this isn't it. I don't have to cram everything into the next however many years I've given, as if this was the only, the only thing that was going to happen to me. I've got eternity to play with. You've got eternity to play with. And we need to live as if that were so. We need to show in the decisions we make about uh, money and family and a whole host of other things that we believe that heaven, the new heaven and the new earth is home and that this is not it. It's what the Bible teaches us wonderfully, isn't it? What the Bible pictures uh, wonderfully for us right at its end. John uh, writes, 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God will be with them and be their gods. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Suffering is normal, but suffering does have a best before date. One day it will be completely and utterly gone forever. Isn't that wonderful news? Isn't that the day that we long for? Isn't that our prayer, come Lord Jesus? Isn't that how the Bible ends with that prayer? Please come. Jesus soon and make everything sad come untrue. And we need to remember that that heaven is not going to be, as it were, a sort of boring end to our lives, but the great fulfillment of our lives. And that all our right desires, all our right passions will be fulfilled then as we live as perfectly embodied people in a perfect, real, lasting creation. I find C.S. Lewis's words in The Great Divorce really helpful, especially for me as as somebody who experiences same-sex attraction. Any man who reaches heaven will find that what he abandoned, even in plucking out his right eye, has not been lost. That kernel of what he was really seeking, even in his most depraved wishes, will be there, beyond expectation, waiting for him, in the high countries. So much of my life on this planet has been a search for beauty and for perfection. I've looked for it in art, I've looked for it in nature, I've looked for it in literature, I've looked for it, I've looked for it in, in other men. That desire for perfection and beauty that is a God-given desire will be perfectly and wonderfully and ultimately and eternally fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth. We need to grasp hold of that reality. We need to to ponder, how can we help each other look forward to that day? How can we spur each other on to that day? Jesus was spurred on by the joy that was set before him. We need to be spurred on by the joy that is set before us, by our good God who says, come and enjoy perfection with me forever. We need to demonstrate so many things, don't we? So many things that if we're honest, we're not that good at demonstrating at the moment. And so I think we need to take on the challenge that that we are the plausibility problem. We, the Christian church, are the reason why some people who have grown up in Christian homes walk away from Christ because they're same sex attracted. We're the plausibility problem. We're the reason why people in the LGBT community who are intrigued by Jesus are not going to come and ask us about Jesus. Listen to these challenging words from from Henry Nan. Many churches decorated with words announcing salvation and new life are often little more than parlours for those who feel quite comfortable in the old life and who are not likely to let their minister's words change their stone hearts into furnaces where swords can be cast into plowshares and spears into pruning forks. We need, I think, this issue, this really difficult issue we've been talking about today to wake us up and to help us get the gospel better, to help us believe the Bible more, to help us all fall more and more in love with the Lord Jesus Christ so that there is no longer any plausibility problem for any of us. Let's pray. Father God, we need your help. We really need your help. And so we pray for it now, knowing that you will answer that prayer because we pray it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. People in Scotland, and I would also say people in the United Kingdom and probably in most of Europe, are more open to the gospel now than I've known, ever known. But the church is less prepared to communicate it. 
We live in such a post-Christian culture that we're encountering people now who have no conception of what the gospel is. They're not resistant to it, they just don't know what it is. And our challenge as Christians is how do we convey the gospel into the public square, into the halls of power, into the marketplace, into education and media in such a way that engages people. People do not know about Jesus Christ, they have no idea. And asking people to believe in Jesus when they haven't a clue who he is, who's Jesus? you know, tell me about Jesus. They have no concept of Christianity. We're basically bringing up people who are fundamentally ignorant of the gospel and who are being brought up within the framework of a secular thought that completely excludes any concept of the supernatural. We want to take the gospel into the public square and show how as Christians we don't need to retreat from places like Edinburgh and the centres of power, rather we can go in and the gospel will stand up as it's always stood up. We want to engage in evangelism that influences in a place like Edinburgh. At the same time we also want to be equipping Christians and the church to do the same. As you explore our website, I wanted to encourage you to check out a number of different resources we have there. We have a magazine, we have podcasts, we have videos, all kinds of rich resources that you can use in your personal evangelism. And also we encourage you to use them to teach and train and equip others in your churches and your communities to do the same. Make use of them, download them, share them with your friends. And we also encourage you to pray for us, stand alongside us and look to partner with us. We love to come alongside churches and organisations and individuals to help you take the gospel into your neighbourhood. And we look forward to partnering with you in seeing God's kingdom extend here in Scotland and across the UK.